Chapter 26 Sobering Summer They called the child Keiko. The family's joy was unbounded. This was true despite the fact that a girl was not what Yasuko had set her heart on. In the week after the delivery, there in the hospital, Yasuko's heart was full enough, but from time to time she immersed herself in the useless preoccupation with why it was a girl and not a boy. Could she have been mistaken in praying for a boy? She wondered. Could it have been only an empty illusion from the first her joy that she held captive a beautiful child the very image of her husband? It was still hard to tell which parent the baby favored, but at present she seemed to have more of her father's features. Every day Keiko gained weight. A scale was placed beside the mother's bed, and every day the rapidly recuperating Yasuko would record the increased weight on her graph. At first, Yasuko thought that the child she had brought into the world was some kind of monstrous object that had not yet attained human form, but after the first stab-like pains of suckling and the almost immoral delight that followed, she found her love for this offspring with its strangely pouting face something she could not drive from her heart. Besides, visitors and those around her treated this shape that was not yet humanly or one might desire as if it was perforce a human being plying it with words that it could not reasonably be expected to understand. Yasuko attempted to compare the fearful physical pain she had gone through two or three days earlier with the long period of mental torture Yuchi had brought her. In the peace of her heart, now that the first was over, strangely she found hope in the thought that the pangs of the second would last much longer and require much more time for convalescence. First to note Yuchi's transformation was not Yasuko but his mother. This meek, uncomplicated soul in all the simplicity of its nature perceived immediately the transformation of her son. As soon as she heard about the safe delivery, she left Kyo to mind the house and set out for the hospital in a cab. She opened the door of the hospital room. Yuchi was standing by Yasuko's pillow. He ran over and embraced his mother. Be careful. You'll knock me down, she struggled and struck a small fist against Yuchi's chest. Don't forget that I'm sick. Why, how red your eyes are. Have you been crying? I'm pretty tired. It was pretty tense. I stayed through the delivery. You stayed through. That's right, Yasuko's mother said. I tried to stop him, but he wouldn't listen. Yasuko for her part wouldn't let go of his hand. Yuchi's mother looked at Yasuko, the picture of motherhood. Yasuko was smiling weakly, but her face showed no sign of embarrassment. The mother looked at her son again. Her eyes said, What a strange child. Now that you have witnessed such a terrible thing, for the first time you and Yasuko look like a real couple. You were the expression of people sharing a sweet secret. Yuchi feared his mother's intuitions of this kind more than anything. Yasuko did not fear them in the least. Now that her pain was over, she was amazed that she felt no embarrassment over having asked Yuchi to stand by her during the delivery. Perhaps Yasuko vaguely believed that only through something like that would she be able to make Yuchi believe the pain she was going through. One might well say that, except for supplementary lectures on a few subjects. Yuchi's summer vacation started at the beginning of July. His routine, however, consisted of passing the day at the hospital and running around town in the evening. On evenings when he did not see Kawada he gladly went back to his old habits, in company with those whom Shunsuk called his dangerous associations. At a number of bars for the initiated, as well as at Rudon's, Yuchi had become a familiar figure. One of them was 90% foreign in patronage. Among the guests was a counterintelligence man who liked to wear women's clothing. He wore a stole on his shoulders and sidled about flirting with the customers, he did not care who. At the Elysee bar, a number of male prostitutes greeted Yuchi. He returned their greetings and laughed to himself. Are these dangerous associations? Associations with such weak, effeminate fellows as these? The rains had been falling again since the day after Kaiko's birth, Yuchi was in a bar at the end of a muddy lane. Most of the guests were already pretty drunk. They came and went, showing splashes on their trousers they did not bother to brush off. 
At times water flowed in a corner of the dirt floor. On the rough blast a wall a number of umbrellas dripped, deepening the flow. Yuchi sat silently facing some nondescript hors d'oeuvres, a pitcher filled with sake that was not of the best, and a sake cup. The sake was barely contained by the thin lip of the cup. It trembled at the brim, a transparent, pale yellow. Yuchi looked at the cup. It was a cup into which no kind of vision could enter. It was, simply, a cup. Ergo, it was nothing else. Four or five persons were present. Even now Yuchi never returned to one of the bars of the clan without getting involved in one or two adventures. Older men approached him, spinning sweet phrases. Younger boys flirted with him. Even this evening there was a Chuch's side a pleasant youth of about his own age constantly pouring him sake. One could tell from the look in his eyes, as he studied Yuch's profile from time to time, that he was in love with him. The youth was good to look at. His smile was clean. What did that mean? It meant that he wished to be loved. It was not a wish based on any particular ignorance of himself. In order to make his worth known, he went on and on with stories about how he had been pursued by any number of men. It was more or less a bother, but such self-introductions are typical of the gay people. He wasn't carrying it to any point worth complaining about. He dressed well. He was not badly formed. His nails were nicely manicured. The line of the white undershirt visible at his belt was tidy. But what did that mean? Yuchi raised his dark glance to the pictures of boxes pasted on the wall of the bar. Vice that had lost its glitter was a hundred times more boring than virtue that had lost its glitter. Perhaps the reason vice is called crime lies in this boredom brought about by repetition, which does not permit one to steal a second of self-satisfaction. Devils must be bored by nothing else but the glut of eternally seeking out original evil deeds. Yuchi knew all the developments. If he smiled in assent to the youth, they would go on until late at night calmly drinking together. When the bar closed up, they would go out. Feigning drunkenness, they would stand in front of a hotel entrance. In Japan, as a rule, there is nothing strange about men friends spending the night in the same hotel room. They would turn the key of a room on the second floor with an earshot of the whistle of the midnight freight train close by. A kiss instead of a salutation, disrobing, the neon signs nullifying the effect of the extinguished lamp, the double bed with its superannuated spring squealing piteously, impatient hugs and kisses, the first cold contact of the skin of their naked bodies after the sweat had dried, the smell of flesh and pomade. Endless groping for satisfaction filled with impatience for the same bodies, little screams belying masculine vanity, hands wet with hair oil. Then the pitiable facsimile of physical satisfaction, the evaporation of all that perspiration, the groping under pillows for cigarettes and matches, the faintly shining whites of eyes. Then the endless conversation surging as over a broken dam and the descent to the childish play of nothing more than two men friends with their desire for a time satisfied, tests of strength in the dark night, stabs at wrestling, various other inanities. Suppose I go out with this youth, Yuchi thought, looking at his sake cup. It will be nothing new, I know that the demands of originality will be no more satisfied than before. Why is the love of men so irresolute as this? And yet is not the very stuff of homosexuality that simple state of pure friendship that comes after the act. That lonely state of returning, lust appeased, mutually to the state of being simply members of the same sex had not their lust been granted for the very purpose of building to such a state. Those of this ilk love each other because they are men, they like to think, but is it not the cruel truth that by loving they recognize for the first time that they are men? Before loving, something extremely subtle inhabits the consciousness of these people. Their desire is closer to metaphysics than to sexuality. And what is that? Nevertheless, everywhere he looked he found only the wish to get away. Psychicus homosexual lovers had found no way out save the priesthood or love suicide. Are you leaving already? said the youth to Yuchi, who had asked for his check. Yes from Kanda Station. Kanda. Right. Good, 
I'll walk you to the station. They made their way out of the muddy hole and walked slowly through the jumbled alley of drinking places under the elevated tracks toward the station. It was 10 p.m. Activity was at its height in the alley. The rain started again. It was extremely muggy. Yuchi wore a white polo shirt, the youth wore a blue one and carried a briefcase by the handle. The street was narrow, they got under a single umbrella. The youth suggested they get something cold to drink. Yuchi assented, and they went into a little tea shop in front of the station. The youth talked happily of his parents, of his cute little sister, of his family business in a fairly big shoe store in Higashi Nakano, of his father's hopes for him, of his own small bank account. Yuchi watched the youth's rather beautiful peasant's face and listened. This was a man indeed born for conventional happiness. His circumstances were just about perfect for the maintenance of such happiness. There was just one secret, guiltless defect, known to nobody. That flaw brought everything down. Ironically, it gave to the face of this conventional youth a kind of metaphysical shading he was not aware of. It made him look as it worn out by the exertions of higher metaphysical speculation. He was the kind of man who seemed certainly to have been brought up, were that defect not present, to become attached at the age of twenty to his first woman and thereafter to be filled with satisfaction like that of a man of forty, over which he would ruminate until the day he died. Over their heads the fan whirled sluggishly. The ice in their iced coffee melted quickly. Yuchi ran out of cigarettes and was given one by the youth. He found it amusing to imagine what would happen if the two became lovers and lived together. Men friends refusing to clean up, the house untidied, a life spent doing nothing all day but loving and smoking, the ashtrays would certainly get full in a hurry. The youth yawned, a great, dark, glossy spreading of his oral cavity, bordered by nicely even teeth. Excuse me. It's not that I'm tired. Just the same, I never stop thinking I'd like to get the dust of this company off my feet. This did not mean he wanted to break away from gay things. Yuchi understood it to mean that he wished to enter into a settled life quickly with a chosen companion. I have a charm here. Let me show it to you. Forgetting that he was not wearing a jacket, he moved his hand toward his breast pocket and had to explain that he had put his treasure in the briefcase when he decided not to put on a jacket. Beside his thigh his bulky briefcase lay, the leather peeling off its sides. Its flustered owner opened the clasp too quickly. The bag turned upside down, its contents spilling to the floor with a clatter. The youth bent over excitedly and picked them up. Yuchi did not help him, but scrutinized the objects the youth picked up as they shone under the fluorescent light. There was cream. There was lotion. There was pomade. There was a comb. There was eau de cologne. There was another bottle of cream of some kind. Looking forward to sleeping out, he had brought these things along for his morning toilet. Yuchi could not help feeling repelled by these cosmetics carried about by a man who was not an actor. Unconscious of Yuchi's revulsion, the youth held the bottle of eau de cologne up to the light to see whether it was broken. When Yuchi saw that only about a third of the eau de cologne was left, his revulsion doubled. The youth finished putting the fallen articles back into the bag. Then he looked at Yuchi, puzzled that he had not moved to help him. He remembered why he had picked up the bag and bent down again, his face red to the ears from stooping. From the compartment meant for small articles he took something tiny and yellow and waved it at the end of a red silk thread before Yuchi's eyes. Yuchi took it in his hand and looked at it. It was a tiny straw sandal, plated of yellow stuff, with a red strap. Is this your charm? Yes, a fellow gave it to me. Yuchi looked at his watch, not hiding the fact. He said he had to go. They left the shop. At the Kanda station the youth bought a ticket to Higashi Nakano, Yuchi won to S station. Their trains were on the same line. When the train approached S and Yuchi was ready to get off, the youth who supposed Yuchi had purchased the ticket to S station because of reticence about going to the same destination, was overcome with confusion. His hand gripped Yuchi's hand. Yuchi thought of the hand of his suffering wife and shook it off brusquely. The youth's pride was wounded. 
Wishing to take Yuchi's impolite behavior as a joke, he forced a laugh. Are you really getting off here? Yes. All right, I'll go with you. They got off together at the quiet, night-enshrouded station. I am going with you, the youth insisted, exaggerating his drunkenness. Yuchi became angry. He suddenly remembered a visit he must make. Where are you going to go when you leave me? You don't know, do you? Said Yuchi coldly. I have a wife. The youth went white. He was unable to move. Then you've been stringing me along. He burst into tears as he stood there. Then he went over to a bench, sat down, clutched his briefcase to his chest, and cried. Yuji witnessed this comical end to matters and swiftly ran up the stairs to escape. He was not being followed, evidently. He left the station and almost flung himself into the rain. Before his eyes stretched the hospital buildings, reposing in silence. I wanted to come here, he thought soberly. When I saw the contents of that man's bag fall on the floor, I suddenly wanted to come here. By all rights, it was time he went to his home, where his mother was waiting alone. He couldn't stay over in the hospital. He felt, however, that if he didn't go to the hospital he wouldn't be able to sleep. At the gate the watchman was still awake, playing Japanese chess. Their dim, yellow lamp was visible from afar. From the admitting window a dark face looked out. Fortunately the guard remembered Yuchi, who had made a reputation for himself as the man who had stayed by his wife while she delivered her baby. Yuchi knew his excuse didn't make much sense, but he explained that he had left something valuable in his wife's room. She's probably asleep, said the guard. The expression on this uxorious young man's face, however, touched his heart. Yuchi ascended the dim stairway to the third floor. The sound of his shoes reverberated harshly on the staircase. Yasuko wasn't sleeping, but she heard the sound of the gauze-wrapped knob being turned as if it were a sound in her dream. She suddenly became frightened, sat up, and switched on the light on the stand. The human form standing out of range of the light was her husband. Before she could breathe a sigh of relief, a paroxysm of incredulous joy struck her breast. The manly white front of Yuchi's polo shirt moved before her. The couple exchanged two or three casual words. Out of her native sagacity, Yasuko refrained from asking why he had come to see her so late at night. The young husband turned the lamp so that it shone toward Kaiko's bassinet. Small, pure, half-transparent nostrils solemnly drew breath in sleep. Yuchi was enraptured by the conventionality of his emotions. These emotions, which had until now lain dormant within him, at his moment found a safe and sure path before them and were capable of intoxicating him. Yuchi bade a gentle goodbye to his wife. He had every good reason to sleep well tonight. On the morning after Yasuko returned home from the hospital, Yuchi got up and heard an apology from Kyo. The mirror he had always used while tying his necktie had dropped and broken during housework. This small accident made him smile. It was perhaps a sign that the beautiful youth had been released from the legendary power of mirror. He was reminded of the small, jet black, ornamented mirror stand at the inn at K last summer when his ears were first assaulted by Shunsuke's praise of beauty and he entered so closely into that association with the all seeing mirror. Before that, Yuchi, following the usual male predilection, had resolutely refrained from thinking of himself as beautiful. Now that the mirror was broken, would he not once more be governed by that taboo? One evening they were having a going away party for a foreigner at Jackie's house. Yuchi was invited through an intermediary. His presence would be important during the evening's festivities. Jackie would rise in the estimation of the many guests if Yuchi came. On hearing this, Yuchi vacillated, but he finally decided to accept. Everything was the same as the gay party last Christmas. All the young men who had been invited were waiting at Rudon's. All wore Aloha shirts, which were really very becoming to them. Aichen, the Oasis Kimikan, and others were among them just as the year before. The foreign contingent was different, making the gathering fine and fresh a feature. There were also new faces in the group. 
A young man named Ken Chan was one, Kachan was another. The former was the son of the owner of a large eel shop in Asokusa. The father of the other was the manager of a branch bank, noted for reliability. Everyone grumbled about the rainy mugginess as they sat waiting for the foreigner's car. They told silly stories over their cold drinks. Kimikan had an interesting story to tell. The former proprietor of a fruit store in Shinjuku had moved a barracks building after the war, and when he was preparing to have it made into a two-story permanent building, he took part, as the head of the firm, in a groundbreaking ceremony. With a smug face he offered the sacred tree to God. Then it became the special duty of a beautiful young employee to offer the sacred tree. The other people didn't know it, but this altogether ordinary ceremony was a secret wedding performed before the eyes of the populace. The two men, lovers for a long time, would set up housekeeping together the evening after the groundbreaking ceremony. The boss had secured a divorce from his wife a month before. The young men in their colorful aloha shirts, arms bare, sat variously posed in the chairs of this habitual hangout. Their necks were all cleanly shaven, their hair gave off a strong perfume, their shoes all shunt like new. One leaned his elbows far forward on the bar, crooned a popular hit, and kept throwing dice from a frayed leather dice cup, affecting grown-up weariness, he toyed with the black dice, which had red and green spots. How were they of attention their futures? A limited number of the boys who entered this world, hounded by lonely impulses or seized by guiltless temptations, would make the lucky toss that would bring them a prize of study abroad, unattainable in the ordinary course of events. The overwhelming majority, after a time, for the excesses of youth, would probably be cast with shocking suddenness into the lot of ugly age. Already in their youthful faces, addiction to curiosity and ceaseless craving for stimulation had left its traces. The gin drunk at seventeen, the taste of proffered foreign cigarettes, those dissipations that wore the mask of fearless innocence. Dissipations of a kind that never left even the fruits of remorse. All the tips forced upon them by adults and the secret expenditures of them, the effortlessly instilled desire for indulgence, the awakening of the instinct for bodily adornment. Theirs was a flaunted degradation, without concealment, no matter what form it took. Their youth was self-sufficient, and nowhere could they flee the innocence of their flesh. If one asked why, it was because their youth, which felt no sense of completeness, could gain no sense of having lost anything at all, though it is customary to feel a kind of completeness in the loss of innocence. Screw Ikimikan, said Kachin. Bats Kachin, said Kimikan. Yuzura Aichin, said Kenchan. Moron, said Aichin. This primitive repartee was like the frolicking of puppies in the glass-walled kennels of a pet shop. It was very warm. The fan wafted a breeze like tepid water. All were already finding this evening's journey tedious, but the foreigners asked to risk two cars that came to pick them up just then. Convertible sedans with the tops rolled back revived their spirits considerably. Thanks to this, they were able to enjoy their conversation, sitting in the wind heavy with suspended rain during the two-hour trip to Oiso. Yuchin, Glad you could come. Jackie embraced Yachi with wholehearted friendly affection. The host, clad in an aloha shirt with a sea, sail, shark, and palm tree pattern, had instincts sharper than a woman's, and when he conducted Yuchi into the hall in which the sea breeze swirled, he immediately whispered in the youth's ear, Yuchin, has something happened? My wife had a baby. Yours. Mine. Wonderful. Jackie laughed heartily. They clinked their glasses together and drank to Yuch's daughter. There was, however, something in this action that brought home to them the distance between the two worlds they inhabited. As always, Jackie was a tenant of the mirror room, the domain of the men being looked at. He would perhaps dwell there until the day he died. If a child were born to him, it would probably have to live on the other side of the mirror, separated from its father. All human concerns, as he saw it, were devoid of urgency. The orchestra struck up a popular song. The men danced, perspiring. Yuchi looked down out of the window and gaped. Here and there in their grassy garden were clumps of bushes and shrubbery. 
In each of the shadows thrown by them, there was a shadow locked in embrace. In the shadows points of fire were spotted about. Now and then a match was struck, revealing clearly part of the prominent nose of some foreigner. Yuchi saw in the shadow of an azalea on the garden's edge a t-shirt with horizontal stripes, of the kind worn by seamen, detach itself from another's body. The companion wore a plain yellow shirt. Two men, supple as cats, gave each other a light kiss and departed in different directions. After a time Yuji noticed the one in the striped t-shirt leaning by one of the windows as if he had been there for quite a while. He had a small, fierce face, impassive eyes, a mouth like a pouting child's, and the complexion of Cape Jasmine. Jackie got up, went to his side, and asked him casually, Where did you go, Jack? Ridgeman had a headache, so I went off to the drugstore to get him some pills. This young man, with his cruel white teeth, his lips so suited to the lie he was telling deliberately and obviously a lie just to torture the other person Yuchi recognized as Jackie's current lover. He had heard rumors about the youth and only needed to hear the alias to know him. Jackie heard his excuse and came back to Yuchi holding in both hands a whiskey glass filled with crushed ice. He said in Yuchi's ear, Did you see what that liar was up to in the garden? Yuchi said nothing. You saw it, didn't you? Anywhere, even in my own backyard, he does things like that. Yuchi saw the pain on Jackie's brow. You're awfully big about it, said Yuchi. Those who love are always magnanimous, those who are loved are the cruel ones. I, Yuchin, have been crueler than he to men who loved me. With that he told boastful stories of how he, even at his age, was made much of by older foreigners. What makes a man cruel is the consciousness that he is loved. The cruelty of men who are not loved is not worth talking about. For instance, Yuchin, those men known as humanists just had to be ugly men. Yuchi had wished to treat the distress of Jackie with due respect. Jackie, however, had anticipated him and was himself administering to his pain the white talcum powder of vanity. He ended by making a kind of incomplete obscure discovery of it. The two stood there for a time and talked of the recent affairs of Count Kaburagi, in Kyoto. Even now, it seemed, the Count showed his face occasionally at one of the in bars in the Shichijo Naiwama neighborhood. Jackie's portrait, as ever, was attended by a pair of candles. Above the mantle it projected its delicately olive-colored nakedness. At the comers of the mouth of this young Bacchus with a necktie sloppily tied on his naked neck, there was an expression that seemed to speak of the impirish ability of joy or the immutability of pleasure. The champagne glass he held in his right hand was never empty. That evening Yuchi forgot Jackie's disappointment and, ignoring the enticing hands held out to him by the many foreign guests, went to bed with a boy who pleased him. The boy's eyes were round. His round cheeks, with beard not yet developed, were white as peeled fruit. After the act was over, Yuchi yearned to return home. It was one o'clock in the morning. One of the foreigners, who also had to be back in Tokyo that night, offered to drive Yuchi back in his car. Yuchi was very grateful for the offer. Out of natural courtesy, he sat in the seat next to the foreigner, who was driving. The middle-aged. Ruddy complexity and foreigner was an American of German ancestry. He treated Yuchi politely and spoke of his home in Philadelphia. He explained the origin of the name, from a town of Asia Minor of the time of ancient Greece. The Phil was the Greek word philio, meaning love, Adelphia was from Adolphos, meaning brother. In short, my hometown is the country of brotherly love, he said. Then, still speeding along on the deserted highway, he took one hand off the wheel and gripped Yuchi's hand. He put his hand back on the wheel and suddenly swung it hard to the left. The car veered into a small, little-used road, then turned right and stopped under a grove of trees rustling in the night wind. The foreigner grasped Yuchi's hands. The two looked at each other for a time and struggled. It was the foreigner's heavy arms covered with golden hair against the youth's arms, Tight and smooth. The giant's strength was amazing. Yuchi was no match for him. In the lampless interior of the car the two fell in a heap. 
Yu Chi was the first to right himself. He reached out his hand to cover himself with the pale blue Aloha shirt and the white undershirt that had just been torn away from his body. Then the youth's bare shoulder was held in the power of the lips of the other, again overcome by passion. Avidly, giant K-90, accustomed to meat, sank voraciously into the glowing flesh of the shoulder. Yu Chi yelled. Blood ran across the young man's breast. He twisted his body and rose to his feet. The roof of the car, however, was low. Besides, the front glass at his back sloped downward. He could not stand upright. He pressed one hand against his wound. White with humiliation and his own helplessness, he stood in a half-slouch, simply glaring at the men. The foreigner's eyes recovered from their passion. He suddenly turned obsequious. Seeing the evidence of his behavior, he was struck with horror. His whole body shook, and finally he cried. Even more stupidly, he kissed a little silver cross that hung from a chain on his chest. Then, still half-dressed, he leaned against the steering wheel and prayed. After that he begged Yuchi again and again to forgive him, explaining tearfully that his virtues and his upbringing were powerless against obsessions of this kind. There was a ridiculous self-righteousness in his entreaties. When he attacked Yuchi with overwhelming force, Yuchi's momentary physical weakness had brought a salutary change in the spiritual weakness of his adversary or so he wished to say. Yuchi hastened to adjust his shirt. The foreigner soon became conscious of his own nakedness and covered himself. It had taken him time to recognize his nakedness, just as it had taken him time to recognize his weakness. Owing to this mad incident, it was morning before Yuchi got home. The wound in his shoulder did not take long to heal. When Kawada saw the scar, he was filled with jealousy and schemed for a way that he too might be privileged to inflict such a wound without incurring Yuchi's wrath. Yuchi was frightened by the difficulties of associating with Kawada, who made a sharp distinction between his social dignities and the joy he felt in the humiliations of love. His treatment threw the young man, not yet schooled in the realities of society, into confusion. Even though Kawada did not mind kissing the soles of the feet of the one he loved, he would not permit that person to touch his social position with so much as one finger. In this regard he was the exact opposite of Shunsuk. The Bitterness of Understanding Yuchi had a happy natural gift for bearing the bewilderment with which understanding attacks youth. With Shunsuke's guidance he had come to all the ready-made understandings. The emptiness of wealth and fame and position, the hopeless ignorance and stupidity of mankind, particularly the worthless existence of women, and the way life's tedium gives substance to all its passions. The sensual urges that even in his boyhood, years had discovered for him human life and all its ugliness had accustomed him to bearing any ugliness of vanity whatever is self-evident. Thanks to his calm innocence, therefore, his understanding was spared from bitterness. The horrors of the life that he had seen, the eye-popping sensations that some dark, deep pit of life was opening beneath his feet, were so many healthy preparatory exercises for his role as a spectator at Yasuko's delivery, nothing more than clean physical training for a track man under a clear, blue sky. Now Yuchi's social ambitions were good-tempered and childish what one would expect in a youth. His financial capacities were acknowledged. At the urging of Kawada, he was thinking of going into industry. As Yuchi saw it, economics was an extremely human subject. To the extent that it was connected directly and deeply with human desires, the activity of its organization was strengthened. At one time, in the developing years of free enterprise economics, it exhibited autonomous faculties. Thanks to a close connection with the desires, the self-interest of the rapidly rising bourgeoisie. Today, however, it was in a period of decline, owing to the fact that its organization had been separated from desire and mechanized, thus bringing about the attenuation of desire. A new system of economics had to find new desire. The greatest evil, certainly, lies only in reasonless desire, objectless desire. Why? Love with the object of propagating children, selfishness with the object of distributing profits, 
passion for a revolution of the working class with the object of attaining communism of virtues in the various ruling societies. Yuchi did not love a woman, and the woman bore Yuchi a child. At that time he saw the ugliness, not of Yasuko's will, but of objectless desire in life. The proletariat also, without realizing it, are probably born from desire of this kind. Yuchi's economic studies had thus brought him to a new concept of desire. He conceived the ambition to make himself over into that desire. Yuchi's outlook on life was not, as one would expect in a young man, marked by impatience to resolve matters. When he looked at the contradictions and the uglinesses of society, he had the strange urge to take their place. Confusing his instincts with the objectless desire of life, he wished for the various gifts of the industrialist. If Shunsuki had heard his wishes, he would have averted his eyes at the thought that Yuchi had become captive to common ambition. Ages ago, the beautiful Alcibiades, also accustomed to being loved, had become in the same way a hero of vanity. Yuchi began to think he would take advantage of Kawada's good offices. It was summer. Between sleeping and crying, and crying and feeding at the breast, the child of not yet one month was not much to speak of. Her father, however, never tired of watching her monotonous routine. Carried away by curiosity, he tried to open forcibly her tiny, tight closed fist in order to see the ball of lint she had accumulated this since her birth, for which he was reproved by her mother. Yuchi's mother, too, out of the joy of seeing the thing she had hoped and dreamed of, quickly improved in health. Yasuko's various symptoms which had occasioned anxiety before her delivery left her without a mark. The happiness of the household grouped around Yuchi was almost perfect. As early as the day before Yasuko left the hospital, on the day of the seventh night observance of Kaiko's naming, a ceremonial robe came from Yasuko's family. Of scarlet gauze crepe, it was embroidered in gold with the wood sorrel of the Minami crest. A yellowish pink obi and a red brocade purse embroidered with the crest accompanied it. This was the harbinger of gifts. From friends and relatives everywhere came red silks and white silks. Baby sets came. Silver spoons engraved with the crest came. Thanks to these, Keiko would literally be brought up with a silver spoon in her mouth. Kyoto dolls came, in glass cases, along with baby clothes. Imperial Palace dolls, baby blankets. One day, a big deep red baby carriage was delivered from the department store. Its truly luxurious construction astounded Yuchi's mother. Who, now, could have sent this? Why, it's someone I don't even know, she said. Yuchi looked at the name of the sender. It was Yatro Kawada. When Yuchi was called to the back door by his mother and saw it, he was suddenly struck by an unhappy memory. It was very much like the baby carriage in front of which Yasuko had stopped for so long on the fourth floor of her father's department store. This was the day they went the soon after she had been diagnosed as pregnant. Because of this gift, he had to sketch for his wife and his mother the background of his association with Yatro Kawada, short of matters that would offend them. His mother only had to understand that Kawada was a student of Shunsuke's. She was satisfied again that her son was the kind of person to be loved by those in high places. And so, at the end of the first week of summer, when an invitation came from Kawada asking Yuchi to his cottage on the Hayama Ishiki shore, his mother insisted on his going. Give him the best wishes of your wife and family, won't you? She said and out of her firm sense of duty entrusted her son with cakes as a gift to his host. The cottage wasn't as big as its lawn, which was almost a quarter of an acre. When Yuchi got there at about three o'clock, he was surprised to see that the old man who faced Kawada on the glass in veranda was Shunsuke. Yuchi wiped away his perspiration as he smilingly approached the two men on the sea breeze laden veranda. In public. Kawada restrained any emotion that might appear excessive. He spoke deliberately, and avoided looking at Yuchi's face. When Shunsuk joked about the box of kicks and the message Yuchi's mother had sent, the three men felt easier. Things were as they always had been. Yuchi noticed a chessboard with kings, queens, minor pieces, and pawns. 
Kawada asked if he wanted to play chess. Shunsuk had been learning the game from Kawada. Yuchi declined. With that Kawada suggested going outdoors while the wind was still good. Shunsuk had consented to go along to the Toshia Buzuru Yacht Basin when Yuchi arrived, after which they were to sail in Kawada's yacht. Kawada looked youthful in a stylish plain yellow shirt. Even the aged Shunsuk wore a bow tie. Yuchi had taken off his sweat-soaked shirt and changed to a yellow aloha. They went to the yacht basin. Kawada Sea Horse No. 5 boat was named the Hippolyte. Kawada had not mentioned it earlier. The name was, of course, something he wanted to surprise his guests with. Shunsuk and Yuchi were charmed. There was also a boat named the Goman Nasa, owned by an American, and also the Nomo, meaning drink. There were many clouds, but the afternoon sun was quite strong. On the Zushi coast across the water, crowds of weekend visitors were visible. Everywhere there were the signs of summer. The bright concrete slope of the yacht basin continued undeviatingly down into the water. The parts of it that were always in the sea were patchy with slippery moss filled with countless half-petrified shells and tiny air bubbles. Other than a few waves that swayed the masts of numerous anchored boats, ever so delicately spreading the shiny reflections of ripples against the hulls, the sea rolled from afar toward the breakwater, rippling the surface of the tiny harbour. Yuchi threw everything he was wearing into the yacht and stripped down to his swimming suit. He walked into the water up to his thighs and pushed the Hippolyte out. The mild breeze which he had not felt while he was on land struck him squarely and affectionately in the face as it came across the water. The yacht went out of the harbour. Kawada, with Yuchi's help, lowered the heavy, zinc-plated, iron sent aboard the view of Kamakura shining in the distance as Kawada was a good yachtsman. When he was sailing, however, his facial neuralgia tugged at him more than usual and caused his guests the uneasy feeling that his tight clenched pipe would fall from his mouth into the sea. The pipe didn't fall. The boat swung west and headed for Inoshima. At that time, in the western sky, there was a majestic cloudscape. A few rays pierced the clouds, as in an ancient painting. In the eyes of the highly imaginative Shunsuk, alienated from nature, the surface of the deep blue distance was filled with a vision of dead men lying in heaps. Yuchi has changed, Shunsuk said. Kawada answered, not really. I wish it were true. He's one that I can't relax with unless I'm with him out here on the sea or some such place. A while ago, during the rainy season, I went to dinner with him at the Imperial Hotel. Afterward we were drinking at the bar when a beautiful boy came in with a foreigner. He and Yuchin were dressed like identical twins. Their neckties, their suits. After a while I looked carefully, even their socks were the same. Yuchin and that lovely boy exchanged quick glances, but it was clear they were deeply embarrassed. Oh, Yuchin, the wind has changed. Spread that sheet over there, weren't you? That's right. But there was something even more embarrassing between me and that unknown foreigner. After we had taken one glance at each other, we could no longer remain indifferent to each other. Yuchi's clothes that day were not to my liking. He had wanted them, though, so I agreed to having them made suit and necky in American taste. It seemed sure that Yuchi had gotten together with that beautiful boy and they had arranged to go out together in similar clothes. It was a strange accident, an unfortunate one, that they should have bumped into each other accompanied by their patrons. It was a confession that they were intimate with each other. The beautiful boy was of light complexion, a marvelously turned out youngster. The purity of his eyes and the charm of his smile gave a strikingly vivacious power to his beauty. I'm a terribly jealous person, as you know, and that whole evening afterward I was in a rotten mood. After all, that foreigner and I had been too timed right before our eyes. Yuchin, it seemed, knew that whatever he said would make him seem more guilty, so he sat the quiet as a stone. At first I was mad and heaped accusations on him, but in the end I had to admit defeat. It's always I who end up trying to cheer him. Always the same developments, always the same results. It sometimes bothers me at work, 
and when asterisk judgments that should be clear come out cloudy, I worry about how I must seem to others. Do you understand, sir? An industrialist like me, with a large organization, three factories, 6,000 stockholders, 5,000 employees, capable of producing 6,000 trucks alone. If a man like me, able to influence all that activity, were in my private life under the influence of a woman, the world would find it easier to understand. But if they knew that I, such as I am, were influenced by a student of twenty or three, the absurdity of that secret would give people the greatest laugh. We aren't embarrassed about immorality. We are afraid of being laughed at. That the president of an automobile company might be a homosexual is something earlier times might have tolerated, but nowadays it would be as funny as if a millionaire were addicted to shoplifting, or if a great beauty farted. When a man is funny up to a certain point, he may use the ridicule to make people love him. When he is ridiculous beyond that point, however, it is unforgivable for people to laugh at him. Do you know, sir, why the third president of the Krupp Steel Works committed suicide before the First World War? A love that turned all values upside down took over his sense of dignity and destroyed the balance by which he had supported himself in society. This lengthy complaint coming from the mouth of Kawada had the air of a lecture or instructional discourse, and Shunsuk found it difficult even to chime in with words of assent. But then, whatever breaks there were in this story of ruin were filled by Kawada's seamanship as the yacht glided through the water. Yuchi was spending most of his time stretched out on the brow, fixedly scanning the area toward which the boat headed. Though he was clearly aware that the words being spoken were meant for him, he kept his back turned to the middle-aged narrator and his aged listener. The sun's rays seemed to glisten off the shining skin of his back. Still untanned, that marble young skin gave off the odor of summer greenery. They approached Inoshima, and turned their backs to the view of Kamakura shining in the distance as Kawada swung the polite south. Although the conversation between the two men was entirely about Yuchi, he took no part in it. At any rate, Yuchi has changed, said Shunsuk. I wouldn't say so. Why do you say that? I don't know why. But he's changed. Frighteningly, as I see it. He's a father now. But he's still a child. Basically, he hasn't changed a bit. Let's not argue. You know Yuchi much better than I do, said Shunsuk, carefully moving the camel hair blanket he had brought along so that it shielded his neuralgic knee from the sea breeze. He adroitly changed the subject. As to what you were saying about the relationship between people's evil deeds and whether they're thought ridiculous, I'm very much interested in the subject. At present, we have taken out of education the minute concern with immorality we used to feel had such tremendous importance. The metaphysics of the morality is dead. Only the humor of it is left. It has become something funny. Isn't that right? The disease of ridicule throws the balance of life into confusion. But if only immorality would maintain its dignity, it would not destroy life's balance. There's something strange about this logic, isn't there? Is it not a reflection of the shallowness of modernity? That something lofty now is without power and something ridiculous has savage strength? I don't particularly care to have a morality looked at as something dignified. You think there are just common, ordinary vices, eh? A golden mean of them? Shunsuk had slipped into his lecture platform tone of many decades earlier. In ancient Sparta the boys were not punished for the thefts they carried out so deftly as a way of developing the agility demanded on the battlefield. One boy stole a fox, but he bungled and was caught. He hid the fox under his clothing and denied the offense. The fox chewed right into the boy's middle. Nevertheless, he kept right on protesting and, without a cry of pain, died. You may think that what is great in this story is its demonstration that self-discipline is a greater virtue than theft. It shows that all is redeemed. But that is not so. He died because he was humiliated that through his exposure extraordinary vice was brought down to the level of ordinary crime. The morality of the Spartans had a sense of beauty in it that cannot be excluded from the models of ancient Greece. 
Subtle evil is more beautiful than coarse goodness, and is therefore moral. Ancient morality was simple and strong, and thus magnificence was always on the side of subtlety, and humor always on the side of coarseness. Nowadays, however, morality has been separated from aesthetics. Thanks to cheap bourgeois principles, morality has taken sides with mediocrity and with the golden mean. Beauty has taken on an exaggerated form, become old-fashioned, and it is either magnificent or a joke. These days it doesn't matter which. The two have the same meaning. However, as I said before, false modernism and false humanism have propagated the heresy of adorning human defects. Modemart has tended, since Don Quixote, toward the glorification of the ridiculous. Maybe you wouldn't mind having the homosexual proclivities of an automobile company president like you worshipped as ludicrous. In short, since it is funny, it is beautiful. Therefore, if even you with your upbringing aren't able to resist it, society is even happier. You should be smashed, then you would be a real modern manifestation of one deserving respect. Humanity. Humanity, Kawada muttered. That is the only place we can hide, the only basis we have for vindication. Isn't that perversity itself this need to drag in all humanity in order to prove that you yourself are human? If humanity is humanity, isn't it vastly more human to do as people usually do, to seek the help of something outside humanity God, or physical or scientific truth? Perhaps all the humor lies in the fact that we go about setting ourselves up as human beings and defend our instincts as human. But the men of society who should listen to us are not at all interested in us as human beings. Shun Suk remarked with a little smile, I'm very much interested in them. You're a very special case, sir. Yes, I am, after all, the monkey known as an artist. There was a great splash near the bow. When they looked they saw that Yuchi, perhaps feeling left out, perhaps sick of the boring dialogue, had dived into the water and swum off. From the glassy troughs between the waves, the sinews of a smooth back and shapely arms appeared, glittering and goruscating. The swimmer had not plunged in without a purpose. A hundred yards to the right of the yacht appeared Najima, whose strange shape had been visible even in the offing back at Buzuru. Najima was a low, oblong island formed by a succession of bald rocks that barely protruded from the sea. There were no trees except a single, undergrown, twisted pine. Thus, what made the sight of the uninhabited island even more mysterious was a gigantic tory, towering above the water line at the center of the highest rock and supported, since it was not yet complete, by great ropes stretched from the surrounding terrain. Under the light filtering dazzlingly through the clouds, the tori and the ropes leading to it soared in a silhouette full of meaning. No workmen were visible. The shrine that should have been grouped with the tori under construction, probably, was not visible. One could not determine, therefore, which way the tori faced. It stood aloof upon the sea, the figure of objectless adoration. Its form was black, but all around, the sea glittered in the western sun. Yuchi caught hold of a rock and climbed onto the island. He seemed to be impelled by childish curiosity to advance closer to the dory. He disappeared between two rocks and then climbed another. When he got to the dory, the naked youth, the western sky ablaze at his back, presented the lines of a sculpture in marvelous silhouette. He rested one hand on the dory and, lifting the other hand high, waved to the pair on the yacht. Kawada brought the Hippolyte as close to Najima as he could without striking some sunken reef, and waited for Yuchi to swim back. Shunsuk pointed to the form of the young man at the side of the tori and said, Is that funny? No. What is it? That's beautiful. It's frightening, but that can't be helped. If so, Mr. Kawada, where is the humor? Kawada slightly bowed his eternally unbending head and said, I must rescue myself from the ridiculous. When he heard this, Shunsuk laughed. It seemed as if his uncontrollable laughter had crossed the water and reached Yuchi's ears. The young man ran along the rocks and appeared to be setting out for a point on the shore close to the Hippolyte. 
The party sailed as far as the Morito coast, then followed the shore line back to Abuzuru. Then they proceeded by car to the Kaden Hotel in Zashi for supper. The hotel there was a small summer resort. Recently it had been released from government requisition. During that period, many of the vessels belonging to the yacht club members had been commandeered for excursions by the Americans at the hotel. This summer the beach in front of it had been thrown open to public use, clearing the air, some hoped, of long-standing grievances. It was evening when they arrived at the hotel. In the grass-covered garden five or six tables with chairs were set out. The colorful beach umbrellas attached to the tables were folded like cypress trees. The turnout was still poor. A loudspeaker on an a chewing gum billboard was blaring a popular song. At intervals it would repeat an announcement about a lost child and cleverly work in a commercial pitch. We have a lost child. We have a lost child. He is about three years old and has the name Kenji in his sailor cap. Will those looking for this boy please report below the R chewing gum sign? When the three men finished eating, twilight had enshrouded the lawn tables. The patrons were suddenly gone. The loudspeaker was silent. All that remained was the sound of waves. Kawada left his seat. Between the old man and Yuchi there fell a silence that had become habitual now. After a time Shunsuk spoke. You've changed. Is that so? You certainly have. It frightens me. I had a hunch it would happen. I had a hunch that sometime the day must come that the person you were would disappear. Because you were radium. You are a radioactive substance. Now that I think about it, I have feared it for a long time. Still, to a certain extent, you are the person you were before. So now, I think, we should part company. The word part made the youth laugh. Part, you say? You make it seem as if there was something between us up to now, sir. Surely there has been something. Do you doubt it? I only understand you in the vulgar sense. There. That expression wouldn't have been used by the old you. In that case, I'd better keep quiet. Yuchi was not aware of the long-standing perplexity and the deep deliberation that these casual words of the author expressed. Shunsuk exhaled deeply in the darkness. There was indeed in Shunsuk Inoki a profound perplexity about his own creation. This perplexity had its abysses, and it had its vistas. If he were a young man, he would soon have recovered from his perplexity. To him at his age, however, the value of that awakening was doubtful. Is not awakening an even deeper delusion? Where are we going? Why do we wish to wake up? Since humanity is an illusion, is not the supremely wise awakening the erection of well-disciplined, logical, artificial illusions in the midst of this greater, highly complicated, uncontrollable illusion? The will not to awaken? The will not to recover, now maintained Shunsuke's health. His love for Yuji was part of that perplexity. He worried. He suffered. The well-known irony of the formal beauty of his work, the spiritual pain and confusion expended in disciplining his emotions, and yet the irony that only through that disciplining would a final, real confession of the pain and the confusion be attained all these struggled in him now. By holding fast to the course he had planned at the beginning, he maintained the right and the initiative of confession. If love went so far as to take away his right of confession as the artist saw it, the love he had not confessed would not exist. Yuchi's transformation, in Shunsuke's sharp eyes, had sketched out this dangerous possibility. It hurts, but at any rate, Shunsuke's voice, hoarse with age, came from the darkness. Even though it hurts me more than I can express, Yuchin, I think for the time being we'd better not see each other. Up till now you were the one to cavil about whether you would see me. You were the one who would not meet me. Now it is I saying we should not meet. If ever the necessity arises, however, if for some reason it becomes necessary to see me, then I will meet with you gladly. Now, I suppose you don't think that necessity will arise. No. That's what you think, but... Shunsuke's hand touched Yuchi's as it lay on the armrest. Though it was midsummer, Shunsuke's hand was extremely cold. 
At any rate, we won't meet again until then. All right, if that's what you wish, sir. Fishing torches flickered in the offing. Conscious that they would probably not have the opportunity again for a time, they fell into their familiar, uncomfortable silence. The yellow of Kawada's shirt appeared in the darkness, preceded by a boy in white with beer and glasses on a silver tray. Shunsuk tried to seem unconcerned. When Kawada revived the argument that had been going on earlier, Shunsuk responded with the air of a cynic. It seemed as if no one knew where this argument, with all its moot points, would end, but after a time the increasing cold drove the three into the hotel lobby. That night Kawada and Yuchi planned to stay at the hotel. Kawada urged Shunsuk, too, to stay over in the separate room reserved for him, but he firmly declined. There was no alternative but to have the chauffeur drive Shunsuk back to Tokyo. In the car, the old author's knee throbbed painfully under the camel hair blanket. The driver heard him cry out once and stopped the car in surprise. Shunsuk told him not to worry and to drive on. From an inner pocket he withdrew his favorite medicine, the morphine preparation Pavanol, and took some. The drug made him drowsy, but it relieved his spiritual pain. His mind dwelling on nothing at all, engrossed itself in the meaningless process of counting the road lights. His anti-heroic heart recalled a strange story that Napoleon on the march never could keep himself from counting the windows along the road, 